Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am so thrilled that you're able to join us. Uh, my name is Dr. James McShay, and I serve as the Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion at UW Tacoma. Uh, before we begin our program today, I'd like to take uh, a moment uh, to offer a land acknowledgement uh, for our campus. The Office of Equity and Inclusion here at the UW Tacoma acknowledges that we learn, live, reflect, and teach on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people, as our campus is specifically situated on the traditional homeland of the Puyallup tribe of Indians. We will make intentional efforts to create inclusive and respectful partnerships that honor indigenous cultures, histories, identities, and sociopolitical realities. We also have a moral responsibility to acknowledge our indigenous connections, as well as create um, and critically reflect on the histories of dispossession and forced removal that have allowed for the growth and survival of this institution. Let us continue to advocate for and partner with our indigenous neighbors as we continue our lifelong work together as a dynamic and inclusive community of educators, leaders, and learners. I would like to give a thanks too to the UW School of Education, UW Tacoma School of Education, uh, for their work on developing this land acknowledgement for our campus and their school. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the second installment of our Coalition for Racial Justice series this afternoon, um, which this program is called Abolitionist Teaching and Healing with the Dope Black Women Collective. This panel presentation is just one part of a series of ongoing conversations that we started this year to create new spaces for folks to find community and to find ways to coalition build, particularly as it relates to honoring and uplifting Black lives and promoting Black thriving and Black genius, which we know is so critically important right now, given the ways in which longstanding state sanctioned violence and the current pandemic continues to wreak so much havoc and pain in our Black and Brown communities across this country. So as we head into Black History Month, we also wanted to introduce our community to different ways of knowing, different ways of being and organizing as we look to eradicate racial injustice and promote Black liberation. As Kianga Yamada Taylor tells us, the struggle for liberation requires us to understand the origins and nature of Black oppression and racism more generally and that it requires a strategy for how we get from our current situation to the future. In our conversation today, we will learn about how abolitionist teaching can be used as a critical intervention and strategy to promote healing, to promote black joy and liberation in education and beyond. To guide us through our conversation, we are so fortunate to be joined by our moderator, Latoya Reed, Latoya Reed is a national award-winning educator and a second generation community college professor who has taught in higher education for over 10 years. Her current professional interests include using learning communities as a culturally sustaining pedagogical practice, exploring institutional experiences for BIPOC faculty and disrupting the white habitus of English composition courses. In pursuit of these interests, Reed has been fortunate to collaborate with other Washington State educators on various projects, most recently on SBCTC's Anti-Racist Writing Assessment Ecologies Grant. She's a proud member of the Communications and Transitional Studies Division at Tacoma Community College. So with that, I'll turn things over to LaToya. Welcome, LaToya. The mic is yours. Thank you, Dr. Uh, James McShay, for having me here to moderate this wonderful event. Um, I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, before I begin to introduce our panelists, I have to point out that it's going to take a moment to do so because their collective accomplishments are so significant that uh, we really just need to take a moment to reflect upon and bask in their greatness. So. Our first panelist is Dr. Kiana Cuts Givens. Dr. Kiana Cuts Givens is an assistant professor, researcher, and writer 
with 20 years of experience in K through 12 and higher education settings. Dr. Givens is a doctor of philosophy in educational policy studies with an emphasis in social foundations from Georgia State University. She is skilled in educational research, program evaluation, multi and intercultural education and foundations, and creative writing and performance. She is a poet, playwright, and educator whose research and writing eclectically centers Black women, teacher preparation, Southern identity, and love. Our next panelist is Dr. Sherelle MacArthur. Dr. MacArthur is a 15-year educator and a six-year teacher educator as a professor of education at the University of Georgia. Dr. MacArthur's courses deal with the historical, social, economic, and political issues that impact and influence schools. Her scholarship centers Black girls, identity construction, and critical media literacy. She has facilitated critical media literacy collectives with Black girls and other girls of color nationally and internationally. As a wellness and life coach, she also supports the holistic well-being of women and girls of color, having full knowledge of the historical, social, economic, and political issues that impact their lives. We are also honored to have with us Dr. Goldie Muhammad, who is an Associate Professor of Language and Literacy at Georgia State University and serves as the Director of the GSU Urban Literacy Collaborative and Clinic. Dr. Muhammad studies Black historical excellence within educational communities with goals of reframing curriculum and instruction today. Dr. Muhammad's scholarship has appeared in leading educational journals and books. Some of her recognitions include the 2014 recipient of the National Council of Teachers of English, Promising New Researcher Award, the 2016 NCTE Janet Imig Award, the 2017 GSU Urban Education Research Award, and the 2018 UIC College of Education Researcher Award, uh, Researcher of the Year Award, excuse me. She works with teachers and young people across the United States and South Africa in best practices in equity, anti-racism, and culturally and historically responsive education. She is the, his, the author of the best-selling book, Cultivating Genius, an Equity Model for Culturally and Historically Responsive Literacy. Our panelist, Dr. Billy Sankofa Waters, is a hip-hop generation Black girl from the South Side of Chicago who grounds her work in Black feminism, critical race theory, abolitionist teaching, Black writers, critical ethnography. She's been teaching faculty of, in schools of education since 2012 and is currently an assistant professor of educational leadership at the University of Washington, Tacoma. She earned her BA in fiction writing and Black, and Black world studies at Columbia College and both her MA and PhD in education at the University of North Carolina and Chapel Hill. Sankofa Waters authored, We Can Speak for Ourselves, Parent Involvement and Ideolo Ideologies of Black Mothers in Chicago and co-edited the Lauren Hill Reader with Bettina L. Love and Venus Evans Winters. And finally, she's the founding executive director of Black Girl Gold Unapologetic Inc. And in 2020, she created the Radical Identity Praxis, which includes four movements towards everyday practice of liberation for Black folks. And our last panelist is Yolanda Seeley Ruiz, who is an award-winning associate professor of, at Teachers College, Columbia University. Her research focuses on racial literacy in teacher education, black girl literacies, and black and Latinx male high school students. A sought after speaker on race, issues of race, culturally responsive pedagogy and diversity, Celi Ruiz works with K through 12 and higher education schools and communities to increase their racial literacy knowledge and move towards more equitable school experiences for their students. Celi Ruiz appeared in Spike Lee's Two Fists Up, We Gonna Be All Right, a documentary about the Black Lives Matter movement and the campus protests at Mizzou. Her first full length volume of poetry, Love from the Vortex and Other Poems was published in March, 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and you can visit her uh, on multiple social media platforms. 
thank you all for being here. Um, it was just an honor to read all that out loud. Thank you for reading it. <laughs> so I actually just want to start on that point. I was having an emotional response reading through those accomplishments and granted it wasn't the first time that I did it. Um, I wonder how did it feel for you just listening to all that you have collectively accomplished? The ancestors are with us. They live and breathe through this. They are excited and there are students and babies and children listening and they can see this and they can see more. Mm -hmm. That's how I and I want to lift up our other sister, Bettina Love, who's not here because she had a previous engagement conflict, but Abolitionist Teaching Network with Dr. Bettina Love. That's our other sister. So yes. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for acknowledging her contribution to uh, your collective. Can we actually just start with how did this collective come into being, the dope Black Women Collective. Like, I'm curious, is dopeness an artifact of being in the collective or do you already have to be dope to be in the collective? I'll, let me I'll, just say, I'm gonna let my sisters answer, but it all started at a lunch. And okay. we have to give props to uh, Sister Dr. Cheryl MacArthur, who is the designer of the poster. She's a dope visual, electronic digital artists. So I, I'm going to be quiet because my memory won't serve it well. But I, I know that it started over a lunch and it has been beautiful ever since. I was just going to say that uh, just to hear someone say the Dope Black Women Collective, I mean, even though we've said it, you know, to each other, we have said it via text, but just to hear it in this context, to also have that followed by the descriptions for each of us, it was like, oh wow, you know, because we're we're sincerely a sisterhood, but just to hear someone say out loud, you know, we do these things, but we do them because we're passionate about them and don't really think twice about them as being necessarily accomplishments. Um, so to hear you read all of that and then to also hear us introduced as a dope black women collective was um, an emotional moment for me. And that doesn't answer the question, but. I think I that it, it does it. though, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you that is the evidence of our dopeness. So, right, and even hearing it, like Kiana is saying, um, as I was listening to all the other sisters' bios, I was like, God, dog, right? Like they are really doing some phenomenal stuff. But I think that we are constantly watching each other and growing and finding ways that we could collaborate, that we could support each other, or we can just be sharpened by what somebody else is doing, right? Like, oh, Sissy's living her dream, her best life over here. Okay, let me stop playing with myself. Let me let me stop playing games and really put my stuff out there. So it is really an iron sharpens iron, sister sharpens sister, dope Black women collective. Yeah, so go ahead, Goldie. Oh no, go ahead, sis. Mm -mm. Okay, you know, we could take up the whole time going back and forth. Okay, let me just say this. It happened so organically. Like, no one said, we're going to make a collective and it's going to be called this. It all just emerged so beautifully and naturally and organically. And I think sometimes that's the best relationships happen that way when you don't come in with any like pretenses or plans. You just let love emerge and let sisterhood emerge. And that's what happened. And, you know, we are so much alike and we are so much different. And I think our, our love and respect for each other and how we learn from each other was, is, was really the glue um, that started it all and that keeps us. Yeah, I say. I, um, so that first lunch or brunch we had was at a meeting with AERA, which is American Educational Research Association Conference, which can be very stiff. You know, I call it like our Walmart of education conferences and, you know, all of that. And so we found each other. I mean, we, you know, we've been in there in different capacities have had different panels, but this was just that organic day where like, let's all meet up. 
And I had not actually met Yoli before, um, but my sister had in California. And so when she was talking, I was like, wait a second, you're, you're that Yoli. Oh my God. And, you know, and so we're, we're popping off talking about crystals and talking about healing and talking about the folks that we're connected to. Cause even though it's the six of us in this collective, we're connected to so many other dope black women. This is not, uh, a static group of us, right? We, you know, we are connected to amazingness. Um, but one of the key points, so to answer your question, do you have to be dope to be here? I mean, you know, dope sees dope. So we just, you know, we gravitate like that. Um, but one of the stories I wanna tell really quickly, cause it's just on my heart. Um, Yolanda gave a presentation recently around her, her healing work and, her PowerPoint slides that Angel designed and all of this. And my sister attended the lecture, I couldn't. And at the same time, I was working on my own project. So my sister comes back and calls me and is like, oh my God, Yoli just presented on this work and it looks exactly like yours. So I'm in my feelings like, oh no, how am I gonna present my work when Yoli is Yoli? Like she got the whole world behind her and I'm just Billy over here in the corner. And so, you know, my sister and my husband were like, call Yoli and tell her, she's your sister, right? Like call her and connect with her. And when I called Yoli, she was like, tell me about the project. Tell me, I'm so excited to hear what you're doing. And she was like, sissy, it's room for all of us. What do you need? Like, and that is the energy. Like it, it makes me, you know, we go, we go to bat for each other. And it's not just those of us who are in this room, we go to bat for our students. I learned from Kiana's curriculum. I'm shaking, I'm gonna be quiet, but the love is real with us and the work we met because we were doing the work. So, yeah. I love that. I, can, I actually, just, can I just tell her that I love her? Absolutely. And that, that gave me goosebumps and sis, thank you. And as long as our babies are suffering, there's work for all of us, Dope Black Women Collective, Dope Brother Collective, Dope Children Collective is gonna take all of us. And so like Billy and Sherelle, all of y'all were saying, it is a concept, it is a sisterhood, but it is fluid and it moves. And so we invite all of you Dope Black Women out there to take it up, right? And have your little chapters of Dope Black Women because this is something that is live and that needs you. I'm sorry, uh, and Sister Rita, can I just say the way that you read those bios, can we talk about that? Can we talk about a potential voiceover career for you? Okay. That's all I'm saying. Okay, I'm going off mic now. Thank you. Um, I actually just wanna go back to this idea of like iron sharpening iron and how I think in a lot of uh, equity work, racial equity work in higher ed, there's this myth of scarcity, like there can only be one, there can only be a few. And it seems like this group is really rejecting that idea. There's room for all of us at the table. Can you speak more to that? Can you give some more examples of how you've created more room for each other and for other educators? I think this panel is, I'm sorry, sis, you said, I think this panel is an example of this, right? Uh, Billy works there and she's like, if I'm gonna put on something, let, let, let me put on my sisters, right? And so when we are doing any level of work, we are considerate of the spaces um, pedagogically, mentally, right? Creatively that other sisters are in. And it's easy to just drop a text and say, hey, are you interested in this, right? And I mean, it just happens all the time. Are you interested in this? Would you wanna do this? I just told somebody to email you or call you uh, because we sincerely consider and think of each other. Golds? Yeah, no, I mean, when I hear questions like this, I think of, is the sun only reserved for a few people? You know, can you imagine if the sun as bright and as big and as massive as it is, if it only shined on just the selected few? <laughs> That's not how creation works. It is so beautiful, so massive that everyone can shine, you know? And so I think we sort of take up this idea of wanting for our sisters what we want for ourselves. When you have a collective, I think, 
and and thinking like, oh, it can only be this person or this. And when you exclude folks, you start to uh, live life in these these ideas of whiteness and Eurocentricity, where they pushed us to be to to focus on individualism and competition. And academia is a model of that in many ways. You know, I see my doc students competing with each other. I say, y'all should be lifting each other. You need each other. What can only one of y'all can do social justice work? <laughs> you know how much we need folks to do liberatory research and practices in schools, the more, <laughs> the better. And so, you know, when we have that, when we go back to our ancestors, which is what Billy said, it all starts there. And when we go back to what they taught us to do and how to be and how to think and how to live, they gave us the blueprint on how to love and build collectives. And there's no space in, when you're doing justice center work, there's no space to exclude folks. There's no space for competition. There's no space for individualism. It's only collectivism. And that's why the word collective is very purposeful, I think. And if I can just lift up to other dope Black Sisters, uh, Queens of the Black Gays podcast. So Goldie, when you said blueprint, you know, they call it the black print. And I think that Auntie Toni Morrison was so powerful in telling us about language and the power of language. And she spoke specifically about the language, language that she uses in her books and that if she did not have black language, she doesn't know what type of writer she would be. And so uh, it is time that we own this language as we own our own ideas. We actually always have, but we have to have the courage to stand by them and not let institutions sway us from it. I mean, we've been on this path. We've always had the black print. You know, let's just start using it uh, much more deliberately. And this is what Sister Billy is doing today. And Brother McShay, thank you. And, and, and again, Sister Reed, because Billy decided, yes, if, we're gonna, if something's gonna happen, let me pull in my sisters. In the same way I'm evoking the Black Gays podcast. If you've not listened to that podcast, please find it um, and see what these two uh, amazing um, sisters are doing. So yeah, you I wanna talk to really quickly about the intention that goes into our communications and the joy. Like, I don't like that, um, you know, all of us have different things that we're into, you know, like Kiana, it could be 3000, um, you know, Goldie thinks that she's a rapper and a comedian, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, she knows that she's a rapper and a comedian, um, you know, and so our text messages are filled with that. So, you know, when you check in on your sister, it could be a text message of, the new um, Michael B. Jordan commercial that, you know, we all have to chime in on or, you know. And that I got dibs on, Billy. Okay, 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 I know. Let's <laughs> <laughs> <They> have them. <laughs> um, or Sherelle, you know, invoking, you know, her, her beyond work where she's like, you know, sissy, like, how's your heart today? You know, what did you get excited about today rather than just what happened? Um, and, you know, all of our schedules are crazy, but we will etch out that 10 minutes, you know, like, I don't like people FaceTiming me randomly, but when Kiana does it, I know it's because she like, I need to put my eyes on you to make sure you're okay. So, you know, it's those intentions of five and 10 minutes that we get with each other throughout, you know, a week, two weeks, if three weeks goes by, it's like, hey, 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 what's going on? I haven't heard from you. And because it's enough of us, we can kind of, we do that for each other. So we're carrying each other constantly. Um, Girl Scout cookies and, you know, ballet photos, all of that, you know. And might I add to that, Billy, Kiana Cuts is an awesome candle maker. So part of what I'm doing through Love from the Vortex, which is a gift that keeps giving, uh, uh, Kiana and I have uh, joined forces and she has created the candle, the Love from the Vortex candle. So it's, it's things like that. And it's what Goldie said, that it's so organic that automatically you think if I wanna do this venture, if I'm thinking about this idea, who in my sister circle would be the best person? Let me throw it up to all of them, but who would be the best one? So Kiana is the candle maker. I love candles. It made sense that we joined forces. So it's, it's, it really is the gift that keeps giving when you have a sisterhood that is authentic and you see the beauty and the brilliance and the genius 
in all that they do. I was I was also going to comment um, yes to all of that that all of my sisters have said, um, but in addition, just in terms of thinking about how we usher one another to opportunities or invite one another to opportunities. I had a phone call yesterday that Goldie, I haven't told you about yet, but um, last year Goldie hit me up and said, hey, are you interested? I know you write, I had just written um, a, a stage play. Are you interested in writing a piece for equitable dinners? Um, so I did, I, I read, you know, reread her book and wrote a piece about that. Well, the phone call I had yesterday was about, you know, we really want to capture the, all of the pieces that we did last year because the New York Times said, you know what, um, out of hand theater is one of the best theaters of 2020 because of this amazing work that they're doing. So, and, and the reason that that's really important is because even though I'm in teacher ed, my heart and my, well, my heart is in teacher ed as well, but my initial plan was theater, poetry, writing, so all of those things. So I think that we definitely have, um, everything was done organically, our connections are organically, but then I also think that our connection very much was um, spiritually designed for us to be in one another's presence. Yeah, I have to say really quickly, I think one of the dynamic things is that our primary identity has never been the academy. You know, our primary identity is in our, our sacredness, our womanness, our, our, you know, how we develop words. I mean, that first lunch became a word brunch. We care about words and we care about the healing power of words. And, you know, Tina, if she was here, she would tell you, I, I didn't, she's a baller. She'll tell you all day, I'm a baller. Like, she's not an academic. And Kiana is a poet. She's not an academic. Like, we got healers in the room. So I think that's the thing that makes us the dopest is that it's our inner that connects us, not, not the titles. And we, de we decided in solidarity to put up Dr. She, her, all of us. But that's not our definition at all. And I would just encourage like other um, women or just, just young people in general or people who are in the academy, thinking about it in that way that the academy doesn't define you. So I think that's really important what you just said, Billy, because even though that is how our connection started in the sense that we knew one another through the academy, that definitely is not where it centered. I am so grateful to hear you speak to that point because, uh, you know, I, I know that, I mean, ac the, the academy churns us, right? Like it, it churns us up, it can spit us out. And I wonder, is the, I, the fact that you don't first identify, you know, as, as doctor, you know, you're not fully identified by what you do for your career, is that part of what has led to you persisting and, and thriving in, in the academy? Um, I'll, I'll take that first, I think so. I first uh, identify as a child of God. I second identify as a little black girl from the Bronx. Those will always be my markers, right? And when I came into the academy, I had been in corporate America, which I call my, um, my boot camp mm -hmm. because, um, woof, wow, to be 22, and to be in that was something. So the 13 years I spent in corporate America, I think hmm, allowed me to deal with the academy very differently. And um, that was because I, I had already in some ways been exposed to, um, to some intense racism. I had been exposed to the way that women, and I'm talking about black women, Latinx women, white women, um, were uh, passed over for jobs. I've been exposed to, I was a marketing writer so I had to craft um, reasons why, let's say, uh, Tiffany's or Brooks Brothers or some of these companies would spend money with the New York Times and Business Week. I had to craft the story. I've, I've always been a storyteller. And so a million dollar campaign would come in and my male boss would get the credit. 
right? So in some ways, I think the, the uh, corporate America prepared me for the academy. And I'm not saying that I didn't take it seriously because I have some, some wounds from the academy too, but I came in with a different orientation, first and foremost, knowing that God got me there. And so I always call myself the accidental academic because I didn't intend, I started as a researcher to help do accreditation. I did not intend to be a tenure track faculty. And so I said, since I'm here, I'm going to serve the students first. I'm going to make sure I still teach high school second, and then I'm gonna figure out what it means to be in the academy. And so it was never the publisher parish, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that, that meant. I had to learn what that meant. So that's never been central to something that I'm aspiring for, but because I look at excellence in everything I do, okay, if this is the script, let me figure out how to read the script, but let me do it in my own way. So, but it wasn't easy at first, I will tell you, because the academy can be very brutal. It can be, it can give you a lot, but it can also take your soul if you allow it. You know, I, I remember like my first year or two in the tenure track position, I, I stood up at a meeting and I said, tenure is not my ultimate goal. It does not keep me up at night, nor does it wake me up in the morning. And the dean was there. I wanted everybody to hear it because, you know, people start being fake and phony and start doing having certain pursuits toward the wrong thing. And I didn't want my soul to be tarnished by that because I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen to brothers and sisters in the academy. And so it was important for me to say that, for me to hear it and for them to hear it. And then moving forward to do the kind of work that ignites and set my soul on fire. I don't feel like we ever have to limit ourselves to our talents. We're so beautiful and talented you know, poetry and candle making and playwriting and healing and all these things, like why limit, you know? And like, my thing is curriculum writing. I write lesson plans every week <laughs> for children, you know? And I think part of this work is sort of like, dis like rediscovering in the words of like Dr. Cynthia Dillard, who intentionally used the, the prefix re in front of a lot of her language that signifies to go back and to go back again. And I think it's, it's more of a, a, a discovery process. I reflected just recently that when I was a first year classroom teacher, I would go to a workshop or a PD and I would think I know everything about it. It was cooperative learning one time and I would go back and I would make flyers come to Goldie's Cooperative Learning Workshop. <laughs> and I would pass it out like I'm passing out to a party to other teachers in the building. And I was like, and sometimes I'll just be sitting there by myself. And sometimes people will show up to my PD session after school. I said, come for free. It's going to be a good time. I would just think I was an expert going to that PD. But when I look at myself now, and I'm like, this is what sets your soul on fire, Goldie. This is why you do so much PD and write so much curriculum. And so I think like it's important for us to, to rediscover who we are again and again and again. And I would say that that is one of the definitions of abolitionist teaching, that we have the capacity and the ability and the autonomy to continue to explore ourselves creatively, intellectually, with freedom in mind, or maybe not even freedom in mind, but self, self in mind, that it's not selfish. And because we've all started from that place, um, I think you hear it in our pedagogical practices and in our healing practices, because we don't let the academy define us, we don't let that define our students. I know all of us have gone into our classrooms unapologetically, we've written our syllabi unapologetically, um, and we do this with Black girls in mind, because we don't want the same toxic messages to go to our girls that we've seen, whether it's through the curriculum or hip hop or whatever, we're constantly challenging and, and bringing in into, into conversation the things that are healing. So it's not complete anarchy, you know, we use each other's text materials because they are on hand, you know, we're using Tori's work around Iman and mentoring, you know, I'm using um, critical um, quant from my sister Shanice Campbell, we're using each other's work 
And again, doing it unapolog unapologetically because that's where the freedom is. We are not reinscribing white curriculum. We are not starting off the stories from Plato and Socrates. Yes, you know their names, but let's talk about Fanon and Freire and Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks and Treva and Brittany. And, you know, we talk about our sisters here that are present because when we don't talk about them, they get erased. So citing black women, citing our brothers is the abolitionist teaching that we do every single day and get excited about the curriculum. Like, yo, um, like I'm still waiting for Yoli to drop her syllabus. Like it's the next album coming out. So that's sis, nerd I am. <laughs> first of all, sis, thank you for bringing that in. And it's a way of bringing in sister love too, because part of what's framing this conversation is the abolition abolitionist teaching and the healing. And Bettina always says, you know, we're not talking about just tearing stuff down and leaving it there like they did to my neighborhood in the South Bronx in the 70s and 80s, right? Where they, the buildings, they would set them on fire, burn, and nobody came, no one was coming to save us. But what she always talks about is as we tear down these practices, these systems that do not serve, as Goldie would say, full humanity and particularly full humanity for black and brown folks, we tear them down, but we gotta build it up with something else too. And that's where the healing, that's where the critical love comes in. And so, yes, we have to, it's, it's no more reform. You know, it's not, and I said this the other day in a PD, I didn't realize I said it, somebody gave it back to me. I said, school reform is not working because people are not reforming their hearts. So if your heart is not reformed, how are you gonna reform your practice or your pedagogy? Your heart still is not right. So we're not asking for, reformation anymore. We're asking for abolishing, like abolishing the carceral state and we will build something else in the process that will be more humanizing. We don't wanna reform these systems that have not been working since 1954 because Brown versus Board of Education didn't work for us either. So now let's begin to have that conversation about what do we replace it with? So I thank you, Billy, for bringing in the spirit of you know Bettina again um, in this moment. I don't know. I don't even know if I answered the question, but I will say this. Speaking of curriculum, by the way, Goldie, you'd be really happy. There's a group of young people and their teacher who's writing a curriculum for Love from the Vortex. So when we talk about decolonizing syllabi, decolonizing the classroom, okay, let's think about Ngugi and first decolonize our minds. So once we decolonize the mind, let's then decolonize curriculum and have people with social justice in their hearts. And how about having young people write curriculum for young people? That's the ultimate decolonization. That's the direction I want my work to go in next. I promise I'm gonna be quiet after this. I want Goldie to talk about her tenants for, for the genius. Um, but I have to talk about Yoli's work in terms of love for the vortex and not caring about a tenure track because this is not a traditional academic publication. Um, you know, same thing with Kiana's work. So Yoli is putting her business out there talking about relationships and healing and breaking. Like she did her own uh, critical ethnography of her relationship. She dug in to even talk about, you know, her child and what love looks like and the stars. And yo, and for that to not be seen as academic, but she's still writing curriculum from it. She's still talking about how to forge relationships. She's still talking about how to find self. She's still talking about how to love self and to be a mother, to show up for yourself and what that looks like intergenerationally and intercommunally. And so the fact that I'm glad it's not an academic publication because it gets to be able to be traded from hand to hand to hand and still impact people in classroom settings and in neighborhood settings. And she can offer signed copies as I'm sure all of us can um, through different portals. And I just, I had to say that because again, it's not academic, but it's soul feeding. And so I won't go to talk about her tenants, please. Okay, I'm done. Yeah, so the tenants, um, which I call the Hill model because um, it responds to our students, ourselves, our histories, our identities, our literacies and our liberation. And collectively, you know, I've been, I've been rewriting the Common Core for a number of years now because I have been so unsatisfied with the standards. Um, and I've been rewriting them around these five pursuits that our ancestors gave us. I remember reading like, y'all see that meme online where it says, 
Our ancestors did not just leave us with generational trauma. They, they left us with the, the black print, the blueprint, the guidebook, the roadmap for education to educate all children in the United States and across the world. That's beautiful. And so they had these pursuits of uh, identity development, skill development, intellectualism, criticality, and joy. And I, I've been sort of discovering like what happens when I write my syllabus around those five for my students? And something beautiful happens. What happens when I write K-12 curriculum, math, science, social studies, visual arts, world language, all of these around that model, something beautiful happens. And then like what happens, I mean, this model is so cool because it's sort of like reframing curriculum and instruction and thinking and planning. You can do interview questions around them. You can date someone and ask them about their identity and skills and intellect and criticality. You better ask whoever you're dating if they woke, right? And about joy, what about you? It's like the perfect model for life. And this, is, this came from my research of studying blackness. And so, you know, people are just using it and taking it up and, and just sort of like shifting how they do things in education, not just K-12, but higher ed as well. I just want to give a shout out, uh, Ms. Vera Naputi, is, um, she's the teacher and the six young people, she has been their teacher over the 18 years that she's been teaching. And so one is a freshman at Wisconsin, one is a freshman at Clark Atlanta, and four are high school students. And it's because she chose to talk about love with young people that they interacted and said, we want to write this. So I, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Miss Vera and how you teach and what you teach and believing that it's important to talk to young people about love and healing. And this is how it starts. You put something out in the world and you can only pray they take it up. That's how revolutions begin. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Waters, I'm grateful that you kind of made that transition into the conversation about abolitionist teaching. Like, what does that mean? What does that look like? Because um, I, I want it to go there. Given the current like sociopolitical moment that we're having, right? We're in a post-Trump America. We're in a pandemic America. We're in an America in which white supremacist insurgents can attack the, the nation's capital and then take the train and go home and chill for a while. What does being an abolitionist teacher mean for you right now in this particular moment? Because I imagine if you hadn't already kind of embraced this movement, this approach, this moment would have created it. I'll open that to anybody. One thing about sisterhood, you know when your other sisters haven't spoken, so we are waiting for Sister Kiana and Sister Sherelle to have their, their airtime and their thoughts. Um, that's what love does, right, Goldie? I was, I was looking at, at the corner of my screen like I was ready for Sherelle, so. I yield to you, Sherelle, and then I'll, I'll go after it's you. Are, it's like this, double touch. Like, who going to jump in first, right? This is um, <laughs> hilarious. I was listening to you talk about the type of America that we're in now. But the rea reality for Black women, the Black women scholars that we are, the Black women mothers that we are, is that we are in the America, America. <laughs> <laughs> and these situations just shed a little more light, right? But this is America's America. And that brings about the significance of abolitionist teaching to completely and utterly disrupt what we have known to be education and schooling and curriculum and instruction. Some of those people who were at the Capitol were educators who came home to teach children that look like my son. And what does it mean when you are willing to uh, cause an insurrection? What does it mean when you're willing to be invested in domestic terrorism, a coup, which we haven't seen since Wilmington, North Carolina? Like, what does that mean 
when you turn around and you go home and on Thursday or Friday of that week, you are sitting in front of black and brown children. This is why what we know of education has to be abolished, right? And completely reimagined. And I think when we start using language like abolish and people, what, what, what is the construct? What is the framework? And, and that's the problem is that everybody is looking and waiting and hoping for a prescription. But you also hear Yolanda talking about what does it mean to lead with your heart? And see, some people can't do that work because they aren't uh, heart-filled, soul-filled people. And that's a, that's a conversation maybe for another day. <laughs> but you are talking to uh, teacher educators now who are former classroom teachers. And how we did the work that we did then is largely because we were moved by our heart. And this is what the underlying basis of everything that we're saying. Why isn't the academy held up high for us? Because that, that, that's not how we move, right? We are spiritually driven women. And that's a heart's work. That's a God's work. That is his work or her work that is being uh, used in us. And so this America, America is what it was eight years ago. And it may likely be what it is eight years from now if we aren't willing to look at the systems and the structures around us, education and schooling being one of them, and say, this ish cannot continue. An activity that I do with my students on day one in absolutely every single class, when I start talking about the need for abolitionist teaching, right? And I get a lot of pushback. Uh, a lot of my students are predominantly white. And I ask them this, okay? So if you've been in school for 13 years at the minimum, you finished K-12, you're now in college, I want you to tell me all of the indigenous people, name names that you learned about in school. And I wait and I write down who they say. We only get Sacagawea. I've only ever gotten Sacagawea, okay? I said, don't give me a tribe, give me a name, name the people. I say, we are sitting here on stolen land. The least we can do is honor them by name, okay? So now tell me all of the Hispanic or Latinx Americans that you learned about. Cesar Chavez, the first person wanna get Cesar Chavez. Okay, but who else? You went through school for 13 years, name another name. All right, okay, now we're at Asian American. And the sad part is I get zero names for Asian American. Over and over and over and over I've done this thing. And then I say, okay, well, let's talk, let's talk about black Americans. And I don't want you to tell me Dr. Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks or Harriet Tubman or George Washington Carver's peanut because he had more than the peanut, but I know that all they gave you every black history month. So now that I've gotten those people aside, now name me black people that you learned about. So when I'm talking about decentering whiteness in our schools and you have a problem with that, but you can name me collectively five people of color in the entire instruction of this country, that's a problem. Not only is it a problem for the black and brown children who have to come through a schooling system in which they don't see themselves represented, it's a problem for white people who for 13 years only see themselves. And so when they get out into a, to a world where there are other people who exist, they don't really know how to handle it. You know why we know that they don't know how to handle it? Because they would jump over a wall, a federal offense, they would break into a Capitol building, they would steal laptops and mail, also federal offenses, with zip ties, because what they needed to have done was what they wanted because they've never existed in a world where they saw other people because the only indigenous person on indigenous land they can name is Sacagawea. This is what abolitionist teaching is. It is being mindful that these are just moments. We get caught up in this thing and the world wants to set on fire for George Floyd, which is an awesome thing. But white folk, <laughs> George Floyd was one of millions. I'm from Georgia. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. And we're talking about a town that lynched my ancestors for sport and brought their children to watch like it was gaming. This is just one moment. So when we're talking about abolitionist teaching, we're talking about we can't do this the way it's been done anymore. It's over for that. Whew. I had to come off <laughs> mic. I need some water. Billy grabbing at her, uh, Sherelle. The mic dropped. I, her name is She Real. We have hip hop names. Her name is She Real, and that was her piece. Yeah. They call me She Real because I'm the truth. But I mean, but it's the reality. Oh, absolutely. We've all been through these school systems. We know what it is and what it looks like. And so this is the reason why 
Uh, many of us are hungry. Mm -hmm. We are hungry for something new. We are hungry for something different. This is how you could have uh, Dr. Loves, we wanna do more than survive. We, this is how you could have a book like that, just take off. This is how you could have Cultivating Genius take off. You, this is how Love from the Vortex can just take off because people are hungry and desperate for something different because we've all come through this very oppressive, marginalizing school structure and the fact that we could be black and still dedicate our time and attention to it. With all the harm that comes from this system and we still say, but I'm gonna dedicate my time and attention to it. Because we recognize the work that needs to be done. And you know, <laughs> and I tell this story all the time, I'll be quick since I've already gone off. Ida B. Wells, Ida B. Wells, Ida B. Wells, Ida B. Wells. Um, activists and journalists, right? Part of the anti-lynching movement. And I, I, you, you have to think about what it must have been like in that time to constantly be around these lynch mobs or seeing your brother and your sister lynched. Yeah, you know how heinous that is? How much that must weigh on a person? Imagine how we are just watching this ish play out on TV month after month after month. And here she is going to these spaces, right? So she's home now. Um, she's gone, gone away from to travel. She comes home now. And um, in her autobiography, it said that she receives word that there's another, there could be a, another potential lynching. They want her to come out, right? Uh, and organize and, and, and try to prevent this from happening. And she said, I'm tired. And I think we've all experienced that tired where it's just like, we, we teach this work, we talk this work, we read in the news and you just get to a point where you're like, I'm done with this. I'm tired, I'm tired. And she said, I'm tired. And her son, her eight-year-old said, but mommy, if you don't, who will? That is how I align my praxis. And I believe that we all do. We don't wait how, who, who should do it, what should be done. We just attack it as if, if I don't do it, who will? And then those other people who are asking that same question, we, we pull them in, we collaborate, we try to be in their spaces. And, and I think that still gives credence and goes back to that original question, how did you become a dope black woman collective? Because we recognize that if we don't, who will? And so we partner and collaborate in ways to advance, to advance our communities. And by advancing our communities, that means advancing our schools for our children. That means advancing for families, black love. That you know, you know what I'm saying? We're, we're talking about moving forward. And we've picked that up in our individual lives, and then we found each other organically to continue that work. And so I think that that Billy and Yoli have said it more than once tonight, but for anybody who's listening, if you don't, whatever your don't is, who's gonna do it? Who's going to write socially justice aligned plays if Kiana don't write it? Who's gonna do it? So don't wait, we don't wait. Because what needs to be done needs to be done now because it's not a capital post-Trump. This is America, America. And it has always been since we have been here. It has always been since the indigenous land was stolen from them. It has always been. So people waiting for the next thing. Oh, the capital's over. I'll wait for the next thing. If the next thing is right now, especially when you black, especially when you indigenous, especially when you're a person of color, especially when you're queer, especially when you're a woman, the time is right now. Listen, Kiana, what you got? Because I ain't got nothing else after that, probably for about six months. <laughs> Look, I'm supposed to be moderating. I need my smelling salts. I can't. <laughs> smelling salts. I don't even know where to go. From that. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, definitely everything that my sis said, like the time is right now. The time is always now. And while the... Um, I was thinking the other day uh, about, a, well, it's a piece that I've, I've been writing. Um, it's a poem and it's called, I Know What You Did Last Summer. And basically it is about how 
we had all these book clubs and all these, you know, uh, these, these campaigns and the marketing campaigns and we're gonna do black this and black this and black this. And now we're here, you know, January, 2021. And what has really changed in terms of what are we doing policy wise? What are we doing in our schools? What are we doing in our teacher ed programs? I am, you know, I, I'm in Mississippi where, and I know my colleagues probably get tired of me saying this when I'm at work. In Mi Mississippi is the state where the majority of the students are students of color. 49% of the students are black students and 80% of the teachers are white. And no one can ever explain to me that disparity. Why do we not have you know, more black teachers, okay? So that's that's issue number one. Issue number two is that the, the teachers, a lot of the teacher candidates that I work with, they haven't um, a clue about the history of Mississippi with regards to education. So one of the ways that I make sure, have always, but definitely started um, emphasizing it even more so in uh, last year, one of the ways that I started to think about abolitionist teaching or to enact abolitionist teaching was before class even starts, I let the students know, look, this is who I am. This is what we're doing in this class. This is what we're going to talk about. And there are several other sections that you can take. So we're gonna start there. So I give, it, I, I give it a few days to see who drops out and who stays. And for the most part, most of them stay either because they don't believe me or the other sections don't work with their schedule or they're genuinely interested. Um, and then we start from, I, I take it as a personal responsibility when Dr. Um, Baba Asa Hilliard said, it is our responsibility as teacher educators to help teachers identify and explore their implicit operating framework. And I took that to mean, we, these teachers don't know who they are because they've been so coddled in whiteness. They've been so protected by whiteness. They don't know who they are. So they say and do all of these things that would give all of us the side eye and you call them on it and they are like, they're so upset because I could never be, I can never be racist. I can never be any of these things. And my, my point to them is always this, listen, you're going to go, you're in Mississippi, for the most part, you're probably going to go into a classroom where the majority of the students are black. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for them? If you don't know who you are, what are you taking into these classrooms? And if you are so committed to um, these deficit perspectives, these incorrect perspectives, then go do something else. Yes, we have a teacher shortage in Mississippi, but at the end of the day, I would rather we figure out how to work that shortage than to be sending teachers into schools to do further damage. So one of the ways that I try to always make sure that you know I'm abolishing what they think or what they um, know to be true regarding the students in Mississippi, regarding black students, regarding schools, I'm always surprised every, every semester, as are they, at, they don't know why they have, um, why a lot of them go to private schools. They don't know that before 1970, Brown was 54, but Mississippi then started moving until about 68, 70, and actually had their last case decided in 2016 that stemmed from Brown. So they don't know that until about 1970, Mississippi did not have um, private schools. Private schools popped up as a result of white parents not wanting their children to go to schools with black kids. So we start deconstructing a lot of these things in class. And of course, there's always some pushback. But for, for the most part, students are like, wow, I had no idea. So what do I do with this? One of the things, um, the comments that I received last semester from a student that was, you know, I said to myself, she's starting the work. Her dad was a police officer. Um, and I didn't know this until the end of the semester. We talked about, you know, abolishing um, policing in schools. And she was very resistant, had a lot of pushback. Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Because we have not, or at least she had not been 
taught to, to feel like the schools could be places where you don't need police officers. If you have the resources you need, you don't need police officers. So we had this conversation and at the end of the semester, they did their reflection and her, she did a, a, a video reflection. Um, and her video reflection, she said, you know, I had to step back and do what you told us to do. Research, read and reflect because my dad is a police officer. And so when you said we don't need police officers in schools, I immediately thought you were trying to attack my dad. And she said, I had to think about that and just look back at some of the things that we've noticed this semester or that we've had go on this year and say, not all police officers are doing the work that, um, that we think that they should be doing or something along the lines of there are bad police officers and we need to address that. So for me, the abolitionist teaching and practice comes in when I can get those students to open the door to start thinking, to start reflecting and start asking questions and not just, and I tell them all the time, you don't even have to believe me, research what I'm telling you. I want you to ask it because if you can research what I'm telling you and you find out that I'm wrong and you can show me that I'm wrong, then that's fine. I'm not the one who holds all the knowledge, but I also need you to not readily accept all of these things that perpetuate um, this, this deficit perspective about black and brown students. So the, the, and I think these are things that all of us have always done. And so for us, in a lot of ways, there's a meme that it has been going around and I've seen where someone is standing in the middle and there's like fire going on. The world is burning basically around, around that person. That's always our experience. The world is always burning around us. So as, as Sherelle was saying, this America is America. And if, if we don't go out and address these things, who will? So Donald Trump's presidency might have highlighted things for other people, but these were things that we have known, that we have always seen, that we have always had to navigate. So it's kind of like, huh, okay, so now everyone else sees and everyone else is panicking. It's like, but this is the work we do. Wow, sis. So each of you, I think, has talked about some of the interpersonal challenges you've had in the classroom when, when you know, introducing um, abolitionist teaching ideas. But I'm curious as to the institutional response and how you might have navigated that. Um, that's a great mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and for sometimes with, with expecting certain responses, you know, I keep about five or six jobs, other jobs in my back pocket. People who know that about me, I, look, because I don't know what their response will be. Even their response today might be different tomorrow. They with you, they support you. They will tokenize us. That happens. Oh yeah, we're doing justice work because look at Dr. Muhammad's work. Uh-uh, you're not talking about structural systemic things. You're not getting out of it to talk about my work, you know? And so, you know, I, I have had moments and situations where my work has been valued, supported, celebrated, keep doing funding for it at my institution. And I've had moments with colleagues where folks try to push me out to try to leave the university and try to make up lies and gossip. I mean, it's like high school almost, <laughs> you know? And to, to, to get to a place of unbotheredness takes time. You know, I had moments where I would close my door in my office and cry. And I had moments where as someone's coming in my office and saying, well, I heard you said I was racist. I said, you know what? There's so much justice I need to do in the world. I don't have time for this foolishness. Now call somebody up and tell her to say it to my face. That's what I told my colleague. <laughs> but sometimes it gets to a, you get to a point where it's like, I'm not, I'm gonna, not going to let you do this to me. And when you start to have confidence and letting people know who you are and what you're not going to do to me, they will respect you and they will leave you alone. That's what I've learned. <laughs> But when you, when you, and, and that takes, you know, I wasn't like that day one, maybe I'm not like that some days, but I try to practice it. I try to 
not make any decisions without calling my sisters. I'll make any decision. Should I go to this meeting? Should I cancel it? I call my sister for everything. Should I drink this water today? <laughs> Even small stuff. Should I use the bathroom right now? What should I do? <laughs> and it's always, <laughs> yes, go to the bathroom. Please you know, we'll do, work, don't hold your bladder. We'll work don't work right your bladder. through the bathroom breaks. But you know, it's, it's much like how they have responded to us in any other institution in the country by tokenizing us, they did that with Dr. King. We see it all the time. By pretending to love us, but trying to get something from us. By authentically loving us, we see that show up too, I'm sure. And, you know, and we just, it, they're gonna do what they do. <laughs> we don't have control over them. I've learned that all I have control over is me. And so when you talk about me behind my back, I've expected it. Oh, well, it's about time somebody said something. Everybody been saying a lot of nice things about me. Earlier this week, I heard somebody say something bad. I said, okay, it's about time. I've been hearing so many good things about myself. <laughs> you expect it. When you're doing social justice work, you should expect the resistance. You should expect the jealousy and you should expect it. And if you expect it, you can plan for it. And if you ain't getting no resistance, I'll just leave it right there. Mm. I want to add so, to both. No, go ahead, Kiana. No, no, no. I was just going to say that same thing. If, if it's easy, something's not right. And I wanted to thank Sister Goldie. Sissy, thank you for jumping in because Sister Reed, that was a powerful question. And a thousand plus percent, plus a hundred, plus a thousand for everything that Dr. Muhammad said, I think what I want to add is to go back almost to where we began, why it's important to know your gifts, why it's important to know your genius. Because for me, when I experienced some very difficult times where I was, for two years, I could not do academic writing. I uh, was traumatized, I will tell you. I had heard some things, I heard it directly what was said about me, about my work, the way I have been treated. It's like after tenure, it's you know, kind of like I started seeing things that I didn't see before and it was very hurtful. And to hear it from colleagues, I cannot tell you what that feels like when you're trying to do this social justice race work. So it is my gift of poetry that allowed me to find my voice again. And in writing Love from the Vortex freed me. It freed me certainly from the things that's in the book, but it freed me. I am in such a period of prolific writing right now. I have more things to write than I have time for. I'm doing things with students. I'm deliberate about that. I finished a second book of poetry a few weeks ago. I'm telling you, it's just like the rain has come down. And I'm saying all that to say it is because I know who I am and I know the talent that God has given me and the genius that I seek to cultivate to purposely use Dr. Muhammad's framework that has allowed me to navigate and to thrive. I'm not, I'm not trying to survive this thing. I'm thriving it. I'm thriving it. So I write to free and heal myself. The poetry has freed me. And yes, I can write anything academically because I don't suffer from a lack of ideas. None of us do. I have more ideas than I know what to do. I have ideas on my phone. I have ideas in a journal. I have ideas written on the mirror. I can't stop it sometimes. So we all have that within us. It's just that when these thing ha things happen, they block us sometimes. And then we believe that they're no longer there. They're still there. Use your genius and your skills to excavate it and watch it return and flourish. And I wanna attach to Yoli. She said, I'm thriving. And, um, and Tina, Dr. Loves, we wanna do more than survive. She said, because surviving ain't living. She said, because surviving ain't living. And I think that we've all had a time when we were surviving. <laughs> but once you, once you feel what living feels like, it's like when you experience peace or you experience joy, you do a lot more to to hold on to it, right? And so now we have just moved ourselves into a space of living. And that doesn't mean that some days you ain't just doing what you gotta do to get through that day. But I'm saying when you fully really living life, 
then you be damned if you let somebody come in and make you struggle through it. That's why so much of our work is outside of the academic space. Because we live in life out here. Thank you. So um, there's a lot to unpack. But <laughs> I feel like I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> so I'm actually going to, there are a couple of questions that we have so far. Um, and, you know, I hope that people who are watching feel encouraged to send in their questions. They can also um, email their questions to eventuwt at uw.edu. Um, but I want to open up the, the floor to some participant questions because, you know, you're touching on a lot of topics that um, people want you to expand upon. So there's one question that I anticipate will get a very interesting response. Uh, the question is this. I, um, I've heard other educators say, I'm not a caregiver. I'm not here to be friends with my students. I'm there to teach them. Can a teacher be an effective teacher without care and love for their students, especially when teaching underserved students? Why or why not? No. <laughs> no. Hell no. no. Period. <laughs> into the O, into the O. Bring Whitney Houston's spirit up in here. No. It's like, why are you I even there? What, what is your intention for me. being in the space mm -hmm. yes you can be happy doing something you could be happy you're not happy being a teacher don't be happy okay. so do something else that makes you happy this doesn't make you happy read right. mail books teaching to transgress teaching community <laughs> uh and decide if this is what you want to do or and not. all about and, and read bell hooks is all about love. Just read bell hooks. <laughs> Wait, I love y'all because y'all are like read this, read that, and I'm like, uh, no exit, exit. <laughs> and you are you already in the classroom? You you know you don't really like them. What what is your point? What is your if, if this is not your passion? Listen, when you're well, maybe in, like go you're teach passionate them. about, but when you're in spaces that you aren't passionate about, when you lack joy, then you bring the joy. From other people you become a joy killer right because the reality of the killers is that when you don't have it inside of you you try to get it anywhere that you can so now you just seeping it from your colleagues you're seeping it from your, your students and that's not fair to them go yeah. do something that brings you happiness and i'll say you know i've worked in k through 12 spaces and they were not spaces for me that age group and that level of control from the school system and all of that was really too much for my spirit to handle. Um, I don't know, as an empath or whatever, I decided to go to higher education because I needed a different level of age to teach and work with and do co-conspirative work with. So it wasn't that I didn't enjoy teaching, but maybe maybe that ain't your, your spot because little babies, it, it, the level of responsibility just blew my mind. I couldn't do it. Um, but, but I, it didn't mean that I didn't love teaching. I just couldn't work in that space, but yeah. And then that person, I would say like, figure out what space is for you. And it might be that you want to do some training in, you know, in a room where you don't have to have relationships with people. You just want to deliver this content, get people to fill out the checklist and go on. So you I may be doing right the training for the IT people or, or you doing the orientation for the new people at the job. Like, so you can still do some facilitation, but if you are the person who I don't really like kids, I'm not here to be a caregiver. I don't want to be, don't don't but you're giving out to show love and it and humanity look this is the best job teach your own children don't mess around with other people's children let me tell you something you can do what you want to do with your own child but when you have somebody else's child exactly. that they have trusted you with you must be excellent you must uh show critical love you cannot and 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 it's not about being friends with children. It's about respecting them, loving them critically and, and learning from them and letting them teach you. If you cannot be humble enough to decenter yourself and your ego, then shame on you. Shame, it's just a shame. And, and you need to do something that makes you happy. This is not it. So yeah, I, I would implore that person, my opening exercises for my classes, I focus on positionality and identity all day long. And so part of my work is, you know, we start out with the where I'm from poem and, you know, all of that. Um, but when we go through the reflexivity cycle, the first question is, who asked you to be here? Mm 
Mm-hmm. Like, that's what you have to ask yourself. Did you show up because you wanted your summers off? It's a job. It was whatever. But who asked you to be here? And what resources do you have that can actually benefit this place? What resources were already here? So you're not coming in trying to save anything, but what resources are already here that you can add to, that you can lift up, that you can integrate? Because if you just showed up for a job, like, and you don't know the so-called blank slate that you're imposing in this space, then you're committing violence, period. So I'm to the, to the children and to yourself, yeah. I'm if so, I could just, I'm sorry, can I just add one ahead. thing? Because sure. I was thinking of Uncle Jimmy Baldwin when all of my sisters were talking and he has this piece called If Black English Isn't a Language, Then Tell Me What Is. And in that piece is a very, Uh, important and and often quoted quote where he talks about that, he's talking about black children and that black children cannot and should not be taught by anyone who doesn't love them. Because to do anything otherwise is to fool a black child and too many black children have been fooled. And they do not need to be in front of adults who repudiate them who ask them to repudiate their experience. And so if critical love is not the basis for what you do, if you do not love it, if you cannot have this deep, profound commitment to the community that you serve, you do not deserve to be in the classroom. It's not about should you be there. You don't deserve to be around other people's children if you cannot love them. Mm. You know, we gotta stop this, we gotta stop asking those questions. And when those questions hit us, we have to interrupt it right away to say, what am I really thinking? This is the problem that there's a lack of love as is. And I know that that person who asked it, it may not be your question. You may be asking it because you've heard a colleague say that. The question is now when you hear it again, what will you say to the colleague? Because we have to interrupt that. And if you're not practicing critical love and care, you can't see children's genius. You can't mm. access their genius. And, you know, y'all, y'all know Baba Asa is my go-to. And, you know, I, I carry this quote with me. I've never encountered any child in any group who were not geniuses. There is no mystery in how to teach them. The first thing you do is te- treat them like human beings. The second thing you do is love them. If you can't do those, and those two things, treating children like human beings and loving them, all go very, very much with caring. So mm. if you can't do that, don't, don't be in that space. Uh, so I'm actually gonna jump in here and say that much of, much of the way you framed your answer seemed to be focused on K through 12 education, but what you said about critical love, like if you aren't teaching from a place of critical love, then you don't deserve to serve that population of students, definitely applies to higher education. Because I've heard this exact sentiment from my colleagues in higher ed who say, I'm not here to take care of them. I'm here to be a content expert. I'm here to you know, share my expertise and everything else is on them. And so I think if people you know, who are coming in from higher ed can hear that piece about critical love being a huge important po- component of their instruction, then they might be able to apply it to themselves as well. Mm-hmm. And critical love is, ma- is making it impossible for our students to fail. Even our, our college students, our graduate, our doctoral students in their dissertation. You know, Yoli teaches me that because sometimes it's hard to advise so many students, even when they look like you. And she'd be like, just keep working with her, sissy. Keep working. Give her another meeting. And I'm like, I've been gave five meetings. Do I give another? And she reminds me of the critical love. <laughs> You're the model, sis. Yeah. I'm the mirror. <laughs> Look at you with the words. Such a poet. You too, Sister Kiana Candlemaker. <laughs> we are each other's mirror. Lord, we have to be. So I'm going to interrupt the love, the love here for a moment for another question. Um, I want y'all to breathe through this because I'm having an emotional response when I read it. So just breathe through it. What do you say to black folks who have internalized whiteness and assimilated so much 
that they aren't willing to engage with the concepts of abolitionist teaching because they would rather hold on to their individual achievements and positions. And additionally, do you have any reading recommendations for abolitionist teaching? Well, first I have some deep empathy, I wanna tell you, because what that must be like to be part of such a beautiful people and not want to attach yourself to that. That, that's, that calls for empathy for me. Um, we work with these people. We, we have these people in our lives, in our institutions. And uh, it requires a lot of patience. I, I often pray for them. It depends on how we come across each other. I am not afraid to call somebody out on their colonized mindset and to have them understand that racism, as Tina would say, Tina Love, you know, we got receipts. We have 400 years of this, y'all, of this de dehumanization project. No one is, escapes it. No one escapes it. I didn't come into my consciousness until I was in my late 20s. I majored in 18th century literature. I could quote so many Victorian novelists and so forth. That was my Shakespeare absolutely love. And it's not to say, I mean, I'm complex. I can love that too and still do. Listen, what's that show? Uh, what's that show, y'all? They say, Your Grace. Come on, y'all know what it is. Anyway, that show. Binge watched it. No. What's Wait, the point? We need more clothes. I, I'm sorry. Girl. Your Grace. I'm sorry. Somebody out there knows. Let me just be quick to say this. I'll come back to it. I'll Google it. Huh? I'll Google it. Bridgerton. Is that Thank you, name? Bridgerton. I knew one of my sisters would know because the community always rises. So I have empathy, I it was a gospel song. <laughs> but it also depends on the relationship I have with them. But I always go back to Ngugi and the, the need to decolonize the mind and to remind them that I understand in the sense, because we have 400 years of this, we've been taught to hate ourselves. We've had systems that have supported that, had have actually encouraged that. So, you know, we're not on this higher kind of stage to say, oh, that's not me. We've all had to work through that internalized hate and that racism. But at some point, it's a choice that you're making. And if you're gonna to choose to be colonized, I can only pray for you. Yeah, I think everything can be explained through history. One of my mothers is a historian and she reminds me of that. Where does that come from? Is it self-loathing? Is it um, you think, is it fear? Is it you have only equated success with whiteness? Cause that happens to a lot of us. And maybe you need to see more models and examples and, and you know, so I always like to work with teachers and educators and humans, <laughs> um, whoever you are, at the source of it, uh, because if there's kind of two sides, if you're if you're like this is who I am, but this is not who I want to be tomorrow, that's a different kind of person. If your heart is closed and feels tarnished to other people's humanity, and you're like this is who I am, and this is who I'm always going to be. I don't care how old you are, you can change your heart while you're on this earth, right? That's why the root word of earth and human is so connected when you study the, the origins of this language. You can change. And so, but it if you don't want to, it, that's, those are hard people. I mean, Yoli tells me like, what, what college courses and PD sessions and workshops will regulate your heart and change it if you are so close to it? But those who are open, you must go back to the original readings of our ancestors, primary source documents. If you read, you know, we're reading Carter G. Woodson, Miseducation of the Negro in Class in my course. And it, my students keep saying like, it's like he wrote it yesterday. I said, you, you see how we still, they gave us everything we need to know to figure things out. You wanna answer, go back to our ancestors, our abolitionist ancestors, our history. And so read everything that you can. Start with Mary McLeod Bethune's Last Will and Testament. If you want a quick read, she said, we didn't, I'm not gonna leave you my house, my cars, my money. I'm gonna leave you a responsibility to the youth and with power that you have. That's a good starting place. 
I would say look into our elders too. A lot of the work that I'm trying to focus on is telling the story of home. And so, you know, Goldie, you make the point of like, where did it come from? And sometimes we have parents and grandparents that don't want to talk about certain things and have shielded us from that and have, you know, the gift of the 70s and 80s through Reaganomics, you know, it created this super black middle class that moved us away from different spaces and, and you know, and technology so that we do not want to remember those lynchings, that trauma. We don't want to remember why we moved from Mississippi. We don't want to talk about the cousins who were sisters and big mama and how we have these networks, but to then reprivilege them as other mothers and other fathers and to talk about, you know, those blue collar jobs that got us our first mortgages and things like that and, and reimagine or redesign in our brains what we're privileging as important, you know, that we don't have to recycle poverty narratives where we can talk about how we were able to thrive in that. You know, Nikki Giovanni has the poem where she talks about, yeah, they'll talk about my childhood where I was poor and the lights was off, but I want them to talk about the fact that I had fun and I was a girl. And so I would say, let's go back to our moms and our dads and, and, and dig for the stories, go to our neighbors, go to the candy lady, go to different people so we can honor those stories that we're scared of, you know, because they're ours. And if we throw them away, yeah. Nikki Rosa. You know, that's my boo. All right, thank you so much for responding to that question. Um, I think that's the, the question I'm gonna leave us with. Uh, and thank you for also offering in your responses, resources, materials for people to investigate, to explore. Um, regardless of whether or not they, you know, are kind of working through their internalized whiteness or, or racism or not. Um, I'm going to turn this whole endeavor back over to Dr. James McShay, but before I do, I just want to say I'm, I'm really just so grateful, so thankful to have been able to spend the, this time with you in your presence, bearing witness to your stories and your wisdom. Um, I, I just really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for creating the space for yourselves and then offering us an opportunity to just bear witness to that. And uh, without further ado. Dr. Thank you, sister. You did a beautiful job. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Latoya. And to all of you, um, just sharing um, what Latoya already stated, like this was extraordinarily powerful um, for me um, to, to listen, um, to kind of um, connect with um, the histories, the stories, the emotionality around the conversations that were um, held today. Um, the conversation was dope. It, it wasn't just dope, it was mad dope. And, and that's, that's one of the words we used when I grew up in the Bronx back in the 70s and 80s, it was, it was mad dope, right? So, um, so just thank you for giving us this, blue, this black print, if you will, uh, for how we can more fully love uh, one another, uplift one another, um, find ways to build a collective that promotes healing and, and liberation for our communities. Uh, this conversation was real and it resonated with me and I know it resonated for all who are part of this call today. Um, Latoya, thank you um, for guiding us so artfully through this conversation. Um, you, you know, the questions um, were just spot on uh, and um, I know it allowed for the, the panelists to, to do some old, their own uh, introspection um, and, and, and thinking as well. So. Um, thank you for this. Thank you for your presence. Um, and to the members of the audience who sent in questions for us, uh, thank you. Um, I also want to just give a very special thanks to uh, Tanya Velasquez, who was um, the person at the, the helm of putting this entire event together. And so we thank you for your time and your stellar work for coordinating this event. Uh, Mark DePaul uh, uh, in IT, uh, you rock, my friend. Um, thank you for your continued support. Um, in your work in, in um, putting together this, uh, this event. Um, Brianna Bales, uh, Jimmy McCarty, who's handling the questions online, um, and the rest of our staff in the Center for Equity and Inclusion. We appreciate all of you. So that concludes our program for this afternoon. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation and I hope you enjoyed